Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Special thanks to Alex and Veronica for organizing this very nice workshop. So um, the plan of my talk for today is as follows. Um, I will briefly review Gramo what, what Gramovitin invariants are. So the first part will be rather introductory. Um, I will tell you basic properties and computational techniques to obtain Gramovitin invariants. And afterwards, I will tell you about Gramovitin invariants of complete intersections and Gramovitin classes of complete intersections. The main result of the talk today will be an explicit algorithm for computing Gramovitin invariants of all smooth complete intersections of hypersurfaces in the projective space. And everything that I will tell, this main result particularly, is based on our paper with Busso, Panderipande and Swankin. So let me start by an introductory review of Gramovitin invariants. So these are invariants that are obtained from counts of curves. So a uh, classical question one can ask to obtain such counts of curves as an example. If you look at the complex projective space P2, you can ask, for instance, how many lines are there passing through two distinct points P1 and P2? And through two points, there is always a unique line. So you say the degree 1 Gramovitin invariant of P2 equals 1. More generally, you can ask how many conics are there passing through five general points P1 to P5. Because there is always a unique conic through five points, you say the degree 2 Gramovitin invariant of P2 equals 1 also. And more generally, you can ask how many degree d curves of genus 0 are there passing through 3d minus 1 general points. And you will obtain these numbers. So through 9 points, you will, uh, uh, you will obtain 12 cubics. And this number will be exponentially increasing. Sorry, through 8 points, you will obtain 12 cubics. And this number will be exponentially increasing. And these numbers will be... Um, called Gramovitin invariants of degree d, and for cubics and in degree 4 they were computed in the 19th century, and the computation is a very difficult computation for afterwards, and it's a result of Konsevich that one can compute all of these numbers for any degree recursively. So for all degrees, these numbers can be computed by a recursive formula, which was proven by Konsevich. And generally, if you set up a problem using the correct number of conditions, then you always get a finite number of curves in good situations satisfying these conditions, which are called Gramovitin invariants. Again, in good situations, if this number does not depend on this configuration. So the definition of a Gramovitin invariant is as follows. You fix x a smooth, smooth projective variety over C. You fix g and n positive integers, you fix a, a homology class beta, and you fix cohomology classes, which are called insertions in Gromovitin theory. Then the Gromovitin invariants of x are counts of genus g curves in x of class beta, with unmarked points passing through the submanifolds, realizing the Poincare duals of these insertions. And I will tell you what I mean by genus G curves in X of class beta, I mean the image, by a curve in X of class beta, I mean the image of a stable map. So above, I illustrated a curve C, a complex curve C. By a complex curve, we just mean a genus G, Riemann surface. And we look at images on the stable maps of such curves into X. And the definition of a stable map is again due to Konsevich. It says that an unpointed genus G stable map to X of class beta, by definition, is a morphism F from C to X, where C is a nodal projective curve of arithmetic genus G, together with unmarked points on it, and we require the image of C to be of class beta, and we also require a stability condition, which says that we want only finitely many automorphisms of C commuting with F. 
And to define Gromovitan invariants, we actually will not naively count curves, but we will construct a moduli space, and using this moduli space, we will describe a count. Because when we naively count curves, the naive count will not be, for instance, the formation invariant, but we want a nice count. To obtain this, we look at this moduli space, so I call m bar g m beta x the moduli space of all m pointed genus g stable maps to x of class beta. And it's known that this is a proper daily Mumford stack, which admits evaluation maps. So there are maps from m bar g m beta x to x, given by mapping a stable map f c x1 to x1 to x to f of x i just evaluating at the i marked point. And then there is a natural way to construct a homology class, which is called the virtual fundamental class. This can be naturally constructed whenever we say there exists a two-term perfect obstruction theory, and in this situation there is a natural one. And this virtual fundamental class is invariant under the formations of the complex structure by construction. And if this moduli space is smooth and of expected dimension, then this virtual fundamental class agrees with the usual fundamental class. And I will not tell much more about this, so you can think of it as the usual fundamental class. So here is the precise definition of Gromovitin invariants. So as I said, we fix non-negative integers g and n, a homology class beta, insertions in the cohomology of x, and we define the Gromovitin invariants of x as the degree of the class given by the cap product of the virtual fundamental class with the uh, push forwards of the, uh, with the pullbacks under the evaluation map of the insertions. And uh, um, virtual this, this degree corresponds to virtual counts of genus G curves and X of class beta with unmarked points passing through um, the Poincaré duals of the insertions. And I want to here illustrate um, the deformation invariance. So here I said by construction we have deformation invariance under the complex structure. In the situation that I'm particularly, we are particularly interested in, if you just look at the elliptic curve in P2, which is given by this equation with tan coefficients by a cubic equation. And if we change the coefficients in this case to change the complex structure of the elliptic curve, it's enough to just change these tan coefficients. And as long as the elliptic curve remains smooth, we want all the Gromovitin invariants to be invariant if we change these coefficients. But we cannot ensure this if we naively count curves, but this construction by virtual counts is a way to um, turn a count which it naively is not deformation invariant to a deformation invariant count. And the problem, a difficult problem is, given any smooth projective variety x, how can we actually compute all of the Gromovitin invariants of x? And here, by computing, I don't mean obtaining concrete numbers corresponding to Gromovitin invariants, but I mean e obtaining explicit algorithms, for instance, recursive relations telling how one can practically compute them. And so far, for all genus, uh, generally, the results that we know are the situations when x is a point. This was computed by Konsevich proving Witten's conjecture. And when x is a projective space, or more generally a homo homogeneous variety, by, Gre by Grebe Pandere Pande, when x is a curve, by Okunko Pandere Pande, when x is a quintic threefold hypersurface, Molik Pandere Pande, and more recently, we obtained an algorithm for computing Chromovitin invariants of all complete intersections in projective space, with Busso, Pandere, Pande, and Swankin. And in the remaining part, I will tell you how this algorithm works. Before this, I would like to review how do we actually compute Gromovitin invariants. So far, there are two known major techniques for computing Gromovitin invariants. These are localization and degeneration. 
due to Grebo Ponderipanda and Chunni separately. So just a short review of localization for computing chromovitin invariance where localization, if X is a tor has a tor section, then the Gromovitin invariance of X can be computed from the Gromovitin invariance of the fixed point locus. So this is what localization says. In particular, if you look at the n-dimensional projective space, there is always a tor section on it C star to n, whose fixed points are just points. So localization says that, in particular, for instance, Gromovitin invariance of projective spaces can be computed just from Gromovitin invariance of a point. And the letter is known by the result of Konsevich, so in particular we know Gromovitin and range of projective spaces. And there is a technical point. Each time we use the localization formula relating Gromovitin and range of X to the fixed point locus, we actually need to insert some psi class insertions. So these are defined as follows. On the moduli space of stable maps to X, there are line bundles Li. Uh, defined as follows, you uh, define the fiber of a, a stable map F, as the, which is a point on the moduli space, as the cotangent line of C at the i marked point, and then you take the first churn class of this line bundle, and this gives a psi class, and then to define Gromovitin invariance, you take the degree of this class given by the cap product of the virtual fundamental class with the um, pullbacks of the insertions under the evolution map and you also insert their psi classes, psi i's to some powers of positive integers. And the second technique that I mentioned is degeneration, a la Junni. And this says that you can express Gromovitin invariance of X in terms of what is called relative Gromovitin invariance of the components of the central fiber for degeneration of it. So you look at the degeneration of X, so that you look at over C, a uh, total space whose general fiber is X, it breaks into some smaller uh, components, simpler components, and the relative Gromovitin invariants are counts of complex curves with additional tangency conditions with respect to the double locus in this degeneration, with respect to D, which is a divisor. And um, unfortunately, this technique applies only in some restrictive cases. So this formula works under restrictive assumptions on the insertions that we impose, the insertions of I's. And what are those restrictive, sorry, yep. I was going to ask what were the restriction, restrictions, but I guess you're going to tell them. Yes, that's exactly here. So what are those restricti restrictive assumptions? So if you denote W, the total space of this degeneration of X, then Juni's degeneration formula, this classical degeneration formula, plus if the cohomology insertions of I are in the image of the restriction map, from the cohomology of the total space to the cohomology of X. However, this map is not surjective in general, because dually, if you look at the map on homology from X to the homology of the total space, this map in general is not injective. And generally, there exist some vanishing cycles making this map not injective. As an example, you can look at the degeneration of a smooth elliptic curve into an nodal elliptic curve. I drove here two cycles that vanish into in this degeneration. So there can exist vanishing cycles. In such situations, if you want to understand the Gromovitin invariance of the general fiber of this elliptic curve, and if you impose insertions by these two cycles, if you want to count curves which satisfy, which uh, pass through uh, these cycles, then you cannot understand those counts of curves in terms of counts of curves in the central fiber because you no more even have the data of these cycles, they vanished. So the generation formula does not apply in this situation when you have insertions that vanish. And what we want is we want to use the generation formula to compute Gromovitin invariance in more generality. In particular, when X is a complete inter intersection, but in also situations, situations when things can vanish. 
So we want to impose arbitrary insertions. And um, in the remaining part, I will explain you how do we go around this issue in the degeneration formula with vanishing cycles. So let me uh, tell you what Cromovitin invariants of complete intersections are first, and afterwards I will tell you how do we go around this issue to compu compute them in generality when we also have these vanishing cycles. So X is a m-dimensional smooth complete intersection of R hypersurfaces in the projective space MR plus R if it is given as the zero set of R polynomials F1 to FR are homogeneous polynomials of degrees D1 to DR. And we want to study Gromovitin invariance of X using the generation. So we pick up uh, the generation as follows. We take the DR, the degree of the last FR. We decompose it into DR1 plus DR2. We write it as a sum like this. And we pick general polynomials fr1 and fr2 of degree dr1 and dr2. Then we look at these equations, f1 to fr minus 1. Uh, the first r minus 1 terms are the same. And for the last term, we impose tfr plus fr1 fr2 equals 0. And if, this, if you look at these equations, they define a one-parameter family where the degeneration parameter is t. If you impose uh, t non-zero, you will just obtain simply your x you started with. For t is zero, you will obtain two complete intersections, x1 and x2, where x1 and x2, x1 is defined by fr to fr minus 1 and fr1, and x2 is defined fr to fr minus 1, fr2. So you obtain a degeneration of x into two complete intersections of um, defined by equations of lower degree, and they also intersect along another complete intersection, D, which is defined by everything, F1 to FR1 and FR2. And you can compute and see that uh, the total space in this degeneration is actually singular, but the singular locus, which I denote by Z, is again a complete intersection in D. So we obtain a geometry where we degenerate a complete intersection into two complete intersections meeting along a complete intersection where the singular locus of the total space is again a complete intersection. They are all of lower degree. And our goal is to find a recursive formula in the degrees. So we want to express Gromovitin invariance of x in terms of the Gromovitin invariance of x1, x2, d, and z, which are all of lower degree. And to do this, we need to do two things. First, because we want to do, do, do this in generality, we want to understand how do we go over, what do we do to handle these restrictive assumptions in Juni's degeneration formula when we have vanishing cycles. And second, we want to express the relative invariance in this obtained in this degeneration formula if you apply Juni, which, which would say, if we go through these assumptions, you can compute Gromovitin invariance in terms of relative Gromovitin invariance. So we, to uh, obtain a smooth space, we blow up along Z, so I denote by X2 tilde the blow up of X2 along Z, in terms of Gromovitin invariance of X1 with respect to D and the blow up of X2 along Z with respect to D, in terms of absolute invariance. And the second part is known, it's a result of Malik Pandaripanda saying you can express Gromovitin invariance with respect to D in terms of Gromovitin invariance of X1 and D. And also when you blow up, it is shown by Malik Pandaripanda, the Gromovitin invariance of the blow up can be expressed of the Gromovitin invariance of what, we, what you blow up at the locus of blow up. And remind was Z, Z is a singular locus in, in of the total space, the yes, and it lies inside D. It's a complete intersection in D. Yeah. Okay. So um, first, I will tell you how do we go around this restrictive assumptions with vanishing cycles. So let me remind you what vanishing cycles when they occur. 
So if you look at a complete intersection of dimension m, you can decompose the cohomology of this complete intersection into a simple part, into what we call a primitive part. So the simple cohomology of x is just the cohomology generated by the cohomology cycles which are obtained from the projective ambient projective space. So they are generated by a hyperplane, by a hyperplane H. So the simple part is just the pullbacks of cycles from the ambient projective plane. And the primitive part is the more complicated part. So you cannot generally obtain this primitive part from the projective plane by pullback. And by Lefschetz cyper plane theorem, this more complicated part always lives in the middle degree cohomology of X. And it contains all of the cycles that are vanishing cycles that cause the trouble. So what we want is we want to compute Kromovitin invariants of complete intersections where we allow also primitive insertions. And the key idea to do this is if you have, if you look at, for instance, the Gromovitin invariants of the elliptic curve where you have insertions that are primitive, so you have point insertions, you impose them to lie on some primitive cycle that vanishes, then the idea, rather than to compute this, we show that you can look at nodal Gromovitin invariants of the elliptic curve where you bring those two points together and form a node. So you no more have any primitive insertions, but just nodes. So the idea is the primitive insertions don't go through the degeneration formula, but the nodal invariants will go through the degeneration formula, and then we will open the nodes again inductively. So here is an example. If you look at the elliptic curve E, I fix genus 2 and n to be 2, so I look at genus 2 Gromovitin invariants with two marked points. And because in the elliptic curve we have H1, the middle cohomology, generated by Poincare dues to these cycles A and B that I draw, everything is primitive, both A and B in this case. So there are four Gromovitin invariants we can compute with primitive insertions. So you can insert A and A, you can look at insertions B and B, A and B and B and B A, where A and B generate the primitive cohomology. There are Poincare dues of these cycles. And then I do claim that rather than computing primitive insertions with two primitive points, it suffices to compute just nodal insertions where I bring those two points together to a node. And the simple explanation, why does this work? Why does it suffice to understand just this simple nodal Gromovitin invariants that I call, which are maps from nodal curves to x? In this case, there is a splitting formula you can open the node, which says that these nodal Gromovitin invariants are obtained by uh, diagonal insertions. So you look at, you can uh, obtain these Gromovitin invariants in terms of Gromovitin invariants of uh, with insertions P1, where P is the class of a point, I just draw a point here, and 1 is the Poincare dual to a point. 1 and P, A and B, B is the Poincare dual to A, and B and A, because uh, minus B and A, because minus A is the Poincare dual to B. So you insert Poincare duals, and there is a minus sign coming in the diagonal insertion. So here, um, a priori, I wanted to tell you I can compute all these four numbers with insertions A, A, B, B, A, B, and B, A, but only from the splitting formula I know that I can, the, um, the information of these nodal Gromovitin invariants tells me information about A, B minus B, A, a priori, but not only four of them. So what are all these four? In the next slide, I will show that actually two of them are just zero and it follows from the formation invariance. And I will show actually AB is minus BA, these Gromovitin invariants with insertions AB are the minus of Gromovitin invariants with insertions BA. And this will also follow from the formation invariance. So by the formation invariance, I actually don't have four invariants to compute, I only have AB, 
And from the splitting formula, I can show that 2 times AB is some simple nodal Gromovitin invariant minus some Gromovitin invariants that involve only insertions that are not primitive. And hence, I can compute all the Gromovitin invariants with primitive insertions, which are just AB in this case, in terms of nodal invariants and some other invariants that we know how to compute. So let me tell you why the deformation invariance implies this, and in general, what we do in more general situations. So if you look at the elliptic curve, we consider a one parameter family, a universal family of the elliptic curve, uh, by varying all the coefficients of the equations defining the elliptic curve. So here, in this example, and the formation invariance, I told an elliptic curve is given by a cubic equation. You can vary all these coefficients, and you obtain a universal family of elliptic curves. So if you look at the Kodaira classification of singular fibers, when you vary those coefficients, sometimes the cycle A disappears, sometimes the cycle B disappears, and sometimes you obtain a cusp, and so on. So the deformation invariance of Gromovitin invariance tells you, if you look at the monodromy, you obtain monodromy invariance of Gromovitin invariance. So if you look at a loop going around a point over which you have the singular fiber where the cycle A disappears, monodromy invariance says that the Gromovitin invariance with insertions A, B need to be equal to the Gromovitin invariance with insertions A plus B and B. From there, you obtain the Gromovitin invariance with insertions B and B need to vanish. And analogously, if we look, go around a cycle over which the other cycle disappears, you obtain the Gromovitin invariance with A and A need to vanish. And if you go around the cusp singularity, the monodromy invariance is going to tell you the Gromovitin invariance with insertions A, B need to be equal to the minus of Gromovitin invariance with insertions B, A. And therefore, as I said here, these are all zero, this is the minus of this, therefore it suffices naively to believe that we can compute all Gromovitin invariance with primitive insertions in terms of such nodal invariance. And in general, what we do is we just study the monodromy of the universal family of X. So we look at X, which is a complete intersection defined by R homogeneous polynomials. We look at the monodromy action on the cohomology of X. We define the space U, the space of coefficients of these polynomials. And I let U0 to be the locus in U over which X is singular, which is a closed subset. And I look at the first one, mantle class pi 1 of u minus u0, which acts on the cohomology. And there is a theorem of Deligne, an old theorem, which says that if you look at the g, the Zariski closure of the image of pi 1, and gl h prim, the primitive cohomology, then g is as big as possible. So if the primitive cohomology has, is of dimension k, it's either the full orthogonal group, if uh, m is even, the middle degree cohomology m, the middle degree, is even, or it is the symplectic group if m is odd. And there are only two exceptions. When x is a complete intersection, which is a cubic surface, then G is a finite group, it's the Weyl group associated to the E6 lattice, or when X is an even dimensional complete intersection of two quadrics, it's, it's again a finite group, it's the Weyl group associated to the Dm plus 3 lattice. So there are just two exceptions where it's finite, otherwise it's as, it's as big as possible. And here is the theorem, the first theorem we show that if you have a complete intersection x in project space, then the Gromovitin invariance of x can be effectively reconstructed. Here, I mean Gromovitin invariance with arbitrary insertions from the nodal Gromovitin invariance of x with only insertions of simple cohomology classes. 
And we study these two situations using theorem of Deligne when x is a cubic surface of an uh, even dimensional complete intersection of two quadrics. When the monodromy is finite, then there is no problem actually because there is no vanishing cycles. So in this case, there is the local monodromy theorem for semi-stable degenerations, which ensures that if you have finite monodromy, it needs to be unipotent and it needs to be identity. And so in this case, when the monodromy is finite, there is no vanishing cycle. And then we can just apply Junli's classical degeneration formula and proceed. But the problem is when the monodromy is big, like OK or, or the symplectic group or the orthogonal group, then to prove this theorem, what we do is to use invariance theory of symplectic and orthogonal groups. And I will tell you in the next few slides roughly how the proof works. OK, so when you look at the primitive cohomology, I denote it by V, so our goal is to study the Gromovitan invariance of X, where we insert an even number of primitive insertions. And I will tell you why, because when we insert odd numbers, there will be zero, essentially, in no Gromovitan invariance. So the data of Gromovitan invariance is the same as the data of a multilinear form from V tensor 2N to Q, which takes these insertions and it maps it to the Gromovitan invariant. So we look at a map, multilinear form, um, where you insert these insertions, where you obtain the degree of the cap product of the virtual fundamental class with the pullbacks of the insertions. And monodromy invariance, as we said, tells you that this multilinear form is invariant under the action of the orthogonal group or the symplectic group on V. And I wanted to point, we look at an even number of primitive insertions, because if we, an, if we would have an odd number of, of insertions, we know that minus identity is an element of uh, the orthogonal or symplectic group, so because minus identity is an element there, then this multilinear form would just be zero if you have an odd number of insertions because the Gromovitan invariant would be equal to the minus of the Gromovitan invariant, so it just would be zero. So our goal is to describe this multilinear form, form Gromovitan 2n, and to do this, the idea is to study 2n pairings, n, n pairings of 2n. So we look at n pairings. By definition, so an n pairing is given by pairing two elements mutually. So it's given by an arc diagram. So if 2n is 4, you have four insertions. You can pair 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 with each other. So this is the first pairing. In this case, there are three possibilities where you uh, obtain pairs out of four elements. So you can pair 1 and 3 and 2 and 4, you can pair 2 and 3 and 1 and 4. So these are the three pairings you obtain as arc diagrams from 2n. And in general, if you look at a general n, there are always 2n minus 1 double factorial pairings. So because you first start with 1, you pair it somewhere. If it is paired for the next one, so to pair if you start with 1, you have 2n minus 1 choices, and if you have that pairing for the next thing, you have 2n minus 3 choices, and so on. And for each pairing, pi, there is a natural multilinear form that I will write in this example, which I denote by alpha pi, which is invariant under the action of the orthogonal or symplectic group. For example, if you look at the pairing p1s here, this natural um, multilinear form that I denote by alpha pi, just we insert this v1 to v4 and it's just the pairing v1 and v2, v3 and v4. And where here I denote by this pairing, the, the, I denote by this parentheses the intersection form, the intersection pairing, which is invariant under either the action of orthogonal or symplectic group, depending if you're even or odd dimension. 
And then we use the fundamental theorem of invariance theory, which says that if you look at all these multilinear forms obtained from pairings, these generate the space of all invariant multilinear forms. So in particular, you can write the multilinear form we wanted to understand as a sum of some coefficients, because all these pairings, all these multilinear forms obtained from pairings generated, you can write it as a combination, linear combination of some coefficients times the multilinear forms given by these pairings. And to understand this multilinear form corresponding to our understanding to Groma within invariance, we need to understand what the coefficients are. So here comes the observation. A pairing does not only determine a multilinear form, but a pairing also defines a way to create n nodes out of two unmarked points. So if you have like four points, if you define a pairing, if you pair one and two and three and four, it also tells you the information of how you can bring pairwise two points together to create nodes. So a pairing, from a pairing you can do two things. You can construct these natural multilinear forms or you can construct nodes. And for each pairing, then if we construct these nodes, we can use the splitting formula. We obtain an equation involving primitive chromobitin invariants, like like in this example for the elliptic curve here, we have the usual splitting formula, which tells you you can, const you can uh, write the nodal invariance by using the diagonal insertion. And you obtain some information, uh, like about on, on when you insert the diagonal, there are these primitive cohomology classes appearing. So, um, for each pairing, we, opt we use the splitting formula, we create nodes, and using the splitting formula, we obtain an equation where on one side we have primitive Gromovitin invariants, on the other side we have nodal ones, but by the splitting formula. So at the end of the day, because there are 2n minus 1 double factorial pairings, we obtain 2n minus 1 double factorial equations with unknown CPI, and it turns out we have as many equations as unknowns, which are indexed by pairings, and we solve this system of equations. So there comes in a lot of algebra. Uh, so I will just naively tell the idea and the details of this part, which involves solving this equation, will be part of Pyrrhic's talks first talk where he will explain the proof in detail. So if you look at the matrix of system of equations obtained from the splitting formula, which is a 2n minus 1 double factorial times 2n minus 1 double factorial, so the non-trivial, first non-trivial observation is that this matrix is actually a matrix whose ij entry is of the form x to the uh, loop number of the pairing pi and pj. And what I mean by the loop number of pi and pj that I denote by L, if x is here, x first is the dimension of V, the middle cohomology, if m is even, and if x, if m is odd, x is the minus of dimension of V. And if I look at two pairings, say p1 and p2, I write the arc diagram corresponding to pairing p1 upstairs to p2 downstairs. The loop number is just the number of loops you obtain uh, in this arc diagrams if you write the pi, the diagram for pi up and pi, pj down. So here I obtain two loops, here I obtain one loop, here I obtain one loop. So this is the corresponding matrix um, in this case when I have four points unequal form. And we show that this matrix M turns out to be exactly of the correct rank we want to obtain, and we solve for all coefficient CPIs. So we find all the CPIs, and hence the result follows that whenever we have a complete intersection, we can reconstruct all of the Gromovitin invariants from just nodal Gromovitin invariants with simple insertions. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, why uh, this also depends on the permutations of insertions, like symmetric book we have to
Yeah. If you give one dimensional space on the nose, on the node. Yeah. I think it's not so simple because actually I skipped some details. When we look at insertions, we are also inserting some tau classes. And that insertions of tau classes is a psi classes, sorry. Uh, those ins additional insertions is breaking the symmetry, am I right? So I, um, we are not only looking at, so we are having additional psi classes, it's not so symmetric, so it's not so simple. But that's a good question, I mean, you can see it's not so symmetric with these things. So can you remind me what's the relation between this M and the C's? Uh, M and the, uh, so the CPIs. So CPIs yeah. uh, are the coefficients here that appear when you write this multilinear form. Uh -huh. It's a linear combination of these multilinear forms of pairings. Uh -huh. And um, for each pairing, yeah, so you construct to, to solve these coefficients, yeah. uh, you construct a matrix. Um, a 2n by minus 1 double factorial, 2n minus 1 double factorial pairing where each entry, is the columns and rows are indexed by these pairings. Okay. And that matrix is this matrix M mm -hmm. and its entries are given, uh, it's, it's a non-trivial computation to show that its entries are given actually like this by loop numbers. Uh, I, I see, but it's there's some equation involving M and the CPIs that you yes. have to solve? We, you have yes, a yes, yes. we use this M to solve equations for CPIs, yes. Okay. But is it yeah. like an explicit equation you write? Is it like yes, <laughs> yes, there are explicit <laughs> equations for each pairing. You have lots of equations and we solve those equations. Mm -hmm. okay. And I skip the details here, so Pirik will tell why this is the correct matrix to solve all these equations to obtain CPIs. Okay. Yeah. So even in that example, is from that matrix, it's not easy to see which CPI. How, what is CPI in this example? Yeah. Uh, so there is some non-trivial computation to compute these CPIs. Yeah. Out of that matrix. Yeah. So in this in this matrix for n equal four, you can maybe see it from this example. It's not so simple, but out of that matrix, determining the rank of its matrix took us quite some time in general. So the next theorem is um, okay. So here we showed that uh, if you have a complete intersection, you can uh, reconstruct. Uh, any Gromovitin invariant with arbitrary insertions from nodal Gromovitin invariants. And uh, now the problem is how do we compute nodal Gromovitin invariants? And um, here's the second theorem. Now the Gromovitin invariants with primitive insertions didn't go through the degeneration formula. We had the vanishing cycles. But in this nodal Gromovitin invariants, we essentially got rid of all primitive cohomology. So we show that they go actually through the degeneration formula. So you can compute simple nodal Gromovitin invariants, with, which are just invariants where you have the domain curve with some nodes and possibly with some just simple insertions, but no primitive insertion. In terms of the Gromovitin invariants, nodal Gromovitin invariants of x1 and the blow up of x2 along this set. So this term is just a generalization of usual Junis degeneration formula where we also allow nodes on the domain curve. It just requires carefully defining what nodal relative Gromovitin invariant is. So you want, if you look at the expansion, you don't want the nodes to go, you want the nodes to go into some interior of some bubbles and so on for this to work. Okay, but we can reduce the problem of computing these nodal Gromovitin invariants using the degeneration formula to compute nodal relative Gromovitin invariants. And now the final step, we reduced everything to computing nodal relative Gromovitin invariants. The final step is to show we can open at the at end these nodes, so we prove a splitting formula for nodal Gromo relative Gromovitin invariants. We show that all the nodal Gromovitin invariants of x1 with respect to d and the blow up of x2 with respect to d 
can be written in terms of the relative usual relative chroma with an invariance of x1 with respect to d and the blow up of x2 with respect to d. And this, to prove this formula, we use some, um, we need to particularly describe in this setup what is the virtual fundamental class for the modular space of relative nodal stable maps. And this description, we use some, some very similar techniques developed by Abramovich et al. Uh, Abramovich school. It's same like when you, you generally, your modular space of stable maps in the usual situation is not generally equidimensional. What you do is rather you look at the modular space of uh, pre-stable curves, you take a virtual pullback because the modular space of pre-stable curves is equidimensional. Here what replaces that modular space of pre-stable curves is what we call the Artin stack associated to C. So we use ideas coming from log geometry, we don't look at the modular space of relative nodal stable maps to X, but we look at the maps associated to the Artin stack associated to X. Because here we, look, we are in the situation where D is just a smooth single divisor, the Artin stack is simple, it's just A1 over C star. And this modular space of maps to this Artin stack is equidimensional, then we define the virtual fundamental class by some virtual pullback and so on. So this, this is the only technical part that I'm more, um, that my background is more familiar with this log geometry stuff going on. And um, the, to review what we do step by step, so our goal was to have, we have a complete intersection X. Then you want to write the Gromovitan invariance of X in terms of Gromovitan invariance of the, so you degenerate it into X1, X2, meeting along D, where Z is the single locus of the total space. Our aim was to write the Gromovitan invariance of X in terms of Gromovitan invariance of these complete intersections, which are of lower degree or lower dimension. First, we showed that we can trade all primitive insertions against nodes. We can create nodes. At the second step, we showed that you can compute nodal Gromovitan invariance with simple insertions in terms of nodal Gromovitan invariance, which are relative. So we generalize Julian's degeneration formula to nodal case. Then we showed that the relative nodal Gromovitan invariance can be computed in terms of simple just a uh, simple relative Gromovitan invariance without nodes, we prove the splitting formula. And then finally, there's this previous results of Molik Pandari Panda saying that you can compute these Gromovitan invariants in terms of Gromovitan invariance of X1, X2, D, and Z. For this blow up geometry, they particularly have a theorem showing that the uh, Gromovitan invariance of the blow up can be computed from. Gromovitan invariance of what we, what you blow up and the blow up locus and so on. Speaking of a question, uh, yeah. what's the difference between S nodal GW and this nodal GW at some point? So here, uh, this nodal Gromovitan invariance is just with simple insertions. So you have some possibly simple insertions because I brought uh, pairwise the primitive insertions together. There might be some other simple insertions left. And then um, these nodal relative Gromovitan invariants, um, we actually can also have some simple insertions. And uh, I, I guess my question is for those, do you need to know about all possible insertions? Or? Yes, yes, that's true. You need to know about all possible insertions. Yes. So, so to, do, to deal with them when they're not all simple again? Yes. What, what was the definition of simple? I have to forget. So simple insertions is, are just insertions which are not primitive. So ah, simple. Okay. So you might have to do it multiple times if yes. you end up with things that are not. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here is the statement of the main theorem. If you have an m-dimensional smooth complete intersection of, given by our polynomial equations of degrees d1 and dr, done for every decomposition dr into dr1 plus dr2. Gromovitan invariance of X can be effectively computed from Gromovitan invariance of X1, X2, D, and C 
where there are either of lower degree or lower dimension complete intersections. And we repeat recursively this theorem. At the end of the day, you obtain a formula algorithm computing Gromov-Witten invariance of x only by Gromov-Witten invariance of a complete intersection of degree 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 in the projective space, which is again a projective space. So you end up being able to write all the Gromov-Witten invariance of x algorithmically in terms of the Gromov-Witten invariance of the projective space, which are known. So this algorithm tells you you can compute all Gromov-Witten invariants of x in terms of Gromov-Witten invariants that are known of the projective space. I want to tell that I just wrote this result for simplicity throughout this talk by saying we compute Gromov-Witten invariants, but we actually write everything using Gromov-Witten classes. This algorithm upgrades to Gromov-Witten classes so roughly, what are these? So these are defined by Konsevich and Manin. So you have a forgetful morphism from the moduli space of stable maps to x and to the moduli space of curves. Then the Gromovit classes are defined as follows. They are Komoji classes in the moduli space of curves obtained by the push forwards under this forgetful morphism the cap product of the virtual fundamental class with the pullbacks of the insertions. And the conjecture of Pandari Panda was saying that for every smooth projective variety, Gromovitan classes of X are tautological. So what is tautological, I will just briefly say in the remaining three minutes. The tautological ring is a very nice subring of the moduli space of curves, which contains all the nice classes, kappa classes, tau classes, psi classes, and so on. So you can define it as, uh, for every GN, you have a subring. So the set of tautological rings is the smallest systems of subrings containing one, and which is preserved by pullbacks, push forwards along to natural maps for getting a marked point, and so on. So I will not tell more about the tautological ring, but it's just a nice subring in the Komoji ring of the moduli space of curves. And the known cases when Gromovitan classes are tautological so far were due to Grebel Pandari Panda when x is a projective space or a homogeneous variety, or when x is a curve. And in our paper, we actually do show that all Gromovitan invariants of all complete intersections with arbitrary insertions are tautological. So to do this, we actually do everything for classes. So all these theorems we prove not for Gromovitan invariance, the splitting, the degeneration, we prove everything for classes. So this algorithm that I set here, so we write all the Gromovitan classes of X in terms of Gromovitan classes at the end of the day and of for the projective space. And the letter is known to be tautological so at the end of the day, we obtain everything for the projective space is also tautological. And in progress is our work where we want to generalize our results. So I told you we only show this for Gromov-Witten invariance of complete intersections in projective space. We want to generalize this to Gromov-Witten invariance of complete intersections in some toric varieties and homogeneous spaces, which is in progress and uh, more long-term, very long-term goal is to prove the Biro-Zero conjecture for complete intersections. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Julia. Are there any questions or comments? Maybe I can ask you something. Yeah. So in, in the step three, I think, of the proof, uh, you were mentioning uh, the relation between the nodal uh, relative Gromovitten uh -huh. and the um, usual Gromovitten, uh, the relative Gromovitten, uh -huh. generally. And um, for, the relative, yes. for the usual relative Gromovitten, mm, these are related also to tropical curve counting. Yes. Right, so does it all the same for the nodal uh, Gromovitten? Yeah, so. Um, relative Gromovitten. Yeah, I. Um, the, the relation between tropical curve counts that I'm aware of is when you look at toric situations. Mm -hmm. 
when on when the, when the components are uh, toric varieties and uh, I right so I don't know in this more general setup and I don't know if we can understand actually uh, the nodal ones in terms of tropical geometry. Um, because usually when we have, when we tropicalize the domain curve in the language that I'm used to using log structures and stuff, for every component of the curve we have a point, it's the dual intersection graph and I don't see the data of the nodes actually when I tropicalize, when self-intersecting nodes, I mean, okay. like um, I wouldn't know how to do this tropically, but good question. Um, sorry, but what says exactly the Verasoro conjecture about the Gomovita environment? Yeah, that's a good question. So there is this um, nice set of operators defined initially by physicists. They satisfy some, uh, they form an algebra. There is a bracket between these operators that is the same bracket as in the Verasoro algebra. And this nice set of operators is conjectured to satisfy the property that they annihilate all of the Gramovitan invariant suffix. So for this conjecture is for any variety x, they claim that there is some nice set of operators which annihilate all of the Gramovitan invariants of x. Yes, with the generating series. So a generating series of Gramovitan invariants of x. So it's a vertex algebra ad, uh, acting by adding or removing uh, some uh, curve or, uh, or some insertion? No? Um, I don't know if how it is related to the vertex algebra. Okay. That's okay. Thank you. Actually, maybe also a related question, which is uh, you describe how to compute each group of within a very in particular. If you, is there like a nice relation I can write using the generating function, if I have mm -hmm. a... Like um, I have x, the generating is x1, x2. Yes, it's yes, a, yeah. Does it look nice when you write the generating function of Gromovic and Uvarius as well? Um, yeah, I mean, in general, um, you can put the Gromovic and invariance into generating series, yeah, uh -huh. and this is done particularly like to like when people, for instance, study modular forms, quasi-modular forms is one particular example. They study symmetries of this okay. functions yeah. formed by this generating series. And it's just nicer to study this generating series. So by the symmetries of this, sometimes you can uh -huh. do, do some more information. And in this case, again, you put all of them into some generating series. And this function obtained by putting them into generating series is uh, annihilated by some operators. Yeah, but the idea of putting things into generating series, yeah. I think one motivation is to... Stu yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to know if it behaves well with this, with this formula you have for... for the uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah, so so that's, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, so first we need to show that this generating series they consider, I mean, we, we, yeah, we need to, we need to use this algorithmic, we need to write a Virozora, we need to reformulate the Virozora conjecture in terms, of in terms of, so that we can write everything in terms of this nodal and algorithmic thing. So we need to reformulate it so that we can okay. show, uh -huh. we can compute the invariance algorithmically using nodal invariance and so on. Okay. Thank yeah. you. My question is about conjecture of Pandora partners that we get only tautological classes. Yes. Is it kind of visual thinking because we don't have any counterexample for some mm -hmm. serious result to believe? I don't think it is a very serious result. Actually, I might be exaggerating to state this as a concrete conjecture because it is just in some introduction of some paper. They don't even state it as an explicit conjecture. They just say, we expect that Gramovitan classes is some conjectural. It's just some elaboration on some introduction of a paper. It's not really... Uh, uh, ex explicitly formulated of a very so uh, I think it's um, in my point of view it's a very it would be a very over optimistic conjecture 
And it's not very concretely written as a conjecture. I just uh, wrote it. Um, it's just some elaboration. But maybe still a comment like one could think like odd cohomology classes like could give like obvious counterexamples because in the total equilibrium ring everything is even cohomological degree. But some of these results say at least for complete intersections, these obvious yeah, source of counterexample does not occur. So uh -huh. maybe in more general it could still happen, but at least like it's a kind of non sure class of examples for this obvious source of counterexample, like things which are odd dimensional or not of odd type. Actually they do not lead to counterexamples. Any other question? If not, uh, we can thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs>